Hello, this is Dr. DeVazier, your organic chemistry instructor. This video will introduce you to specific techniques and goals related to Lab 5, Preparation and Distillation of Cyclohexene. Your four student goals are the following. The first is to always work safely in the laboratory. Make sure that you uh, follow um, principles of green chemistry in uh, both your technique and also in the disposal of waste products. You also want to learn and refine new techniques that will improve your laboratory skills, not only in the organic lab, but in other laboratories as well. The third is to uh, achieve a high yield of your reaction. This lab in particular is, uh, has a, one caveat related to that because um, actually this is uh, one of the ca those cases where uh, safety and yield are actually competing. Um, so of course we'll want you to observe safe practices over obtaining a high yield. In the event of a distillation, you never want your distilling flask to run dry. So if you don't allow your distilling flask to run dry, then you're never sure that you get 100% of your product um, out of your um, uh, reaction vessel. In this case, that is okay. You want to make sure that you follow safety first, yield, in this case, third. Number four, um, which is last but not least, this should actually be at the top of the list, you want to think about the logic behind what it is that you're doing, the science you're performing, the equipment that you're using. Our first goal, again, um, as usual, is to work safely in the laboratory. So there are first a few safety concerns related to this lab. The first is cyclohexanol, um, and just the material itself is hazardous in the case of both ingestion and inhalation. It's also a danger uh, when in contact with the eyes and is a skin permeator. What this means is that the material itself will soak through your skin. Many of the materials that we use don't actually go through your skin, um, but actually stay as a surface, um, react with the surface of your skin. So those can be irritants and they can be problematic and they can damage your skin, but they don't actually sink through your skin. Cyclohexanol is an example of a skin permeator. It actually goes through your skin and will come into direct contact uh, with your blood. So you want to avoid um, having any direct um, skin exposure to cyclohexanol for that reason. Cyclohexene is a flammable material and it has a highly objectionable odor. Um, and there are certain um, students and faculty members that find this uh, very problematic and uh, have actually um, uh, developed uh, sensitivities um, close to that of an allergic response to this material. So you might ask, why on earth are we working with it? Well, um, part of what it means to be an organic chemistry, is, is, in particular an organic chemist, is to work with materials that might be objectionable or that might not be um, uh, very favorable. But um, what we want to be able to do is to manage that in a reasonable way. And the only way for you to um, do that well is to make sure that um, there are um, some ways of measuring your technique and effectiveness. In this case, we're going to make sure that no one is exposed to uh, cyclohexane fumes in the laboratory by showing you some very um, uh, excellent techniques that you can use to, uh, to work safely and make sure that no one is directly exposed. Phosphoric acid is corrosive and should be handled with care. It can easily damage skin um, and your clothing. So, um, like any acid, you want to make sure that spills are contained immediately and neutralized with sodium bicarbonate solution and cleaned up using paper towels. In this lab, uh, you want to make sure, as with all labs, that you use the appropriate personal protective equipment, that is uh, gloves. Typically, in this case, you're going to want to um, think more about latex gloves than, uh, I'm sorry, nitrile gloves rather than latex gloves. Um, uh, for the issue of the cyclohexanol, um, not to say that, that you can pour the material on your hands and it will be, um, uh, will have a preventative barrier, but it's just a, um, a slightly better bar barrier than the latex in this particular example. Um, you also want to work in the hood. It is critical in this lab particular, in particular, that you stay in the hood at all times. You must avoid fumes. Um, and, and exposure to fumes of all laboratory workers um, during this laboratory. Okay, so there should be no cyclohexane fumes in the lab. So how do we do this? Because um, eventually you're going to have to clean your glassware. 
So what you're going to do is you're actually going to clean your glassware and the hood. So, um, so what you have to do is you have to make sure that all of the fumes stay contained within the hood because if you don't, then you're going to be exposing the entire lab to this, not only the objectionable odor but also the fumes that are um, potentially hazardous. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a waste beaker. Now this waste beaker is probably going to be a little bit larger um, than uh, in previous labs. So you might want to use your um, like a larger beaker like your 400 or 250 not because you're going to use that much solvent for cleaning but because you'll need the larger mouth um, the wider rim in order to effectively rinse out all of your equipment and so you want to make sure that you dilute everything you cover it with a watch glass and then bring that sorry cover it by it I mean your beaker you want to cover your waste beaker from your hood take it to the flammable waste container and empty it out. That should be the very last thing that you do so that you don't expose anyone to these fumes during the um, uh, during the laboratory time, during the lab session. Um, and as you rinse, you will then dilute the concentration of cyclohexene, thereby reducing the odor significantly. Um, so make sure that you have your large beaker and your hood that you use to clean out any glassware that's come in contact with cyclohexene. Um, you'll want to pre-weigh your flask with the cork, with the, I'm sorry, with the glass stopper in it so that when you're finished and you want to get your mash yield, you can then just weigh that flask um, with the cork, with the uh, glass stopper um, in it so that you're not exposing anyone to those fumes. So those are the key things. One is to use the waste beaker in the hood Never allow any of the cyclohexene to vent outside of the hood. In order to do that, there's two things you're going to have to, um, to deal with. One is the cleaning of the glassware, which I said you can use the waste beaker. The other issue is to weighing out the, uh, the cyclohexene once you finish your distillation. So in order to do that, you want to make sure that you have a pre-weighed distilling flask as well as a pre-weighed glass stopper. So you want to weigh those two things together to make sure um, that when you take that over to the uh, to the weigh station, you can um, get an accurate accurate measure without exposing anyone to fumes. And then two, there's no substitution for simply thinking through um, the next step in your lab. In this example, you're going to have um, both solid and liquid waste. Um, the liquid waste should go into um, the flammable waste container. This, should, this says aqueous, it should be flammable waste container. The solid waste that you're going to have for this lab is a chemical drying agent, magnesium sulfate, and that should go in the solid waste container. There again, you want to make sure that you rinse that very thoroughly, um, that magnesium sulfate, after you've gotten your product out. Um, in this case, the solid material is not going to be your product, it's going to be waste material. So the liquid is actually, the filtrate is actually going to be your product product. Okay, So your filtrate is your product, the liquid cyclohexene is your product, the solid material, the magnesium sulfate they're going to be using for drying is a waste byproduct. And so you want to make sure that you rinse that thoroughly with ethanol or um, acetone or some other solvent to make sure that you remove the cyclohexene residue before you dispose of it in the solid waste container. You're going to be using a, a new technique in laboratory this week, um, and that is distillation. So you want to make sure that you um, watch the technique tutorial on distillation, and you read the lab materials, um, sorry, you read the uh, supplemental materials um, provided for you, uh, which are the lab protocol. That must be in your lab notebook before you can begin lab. And as always, you want to make sure that you take the online pre-lab quiz. In order to um, uh, make this reaction work, um, what you're going to do is uh, you want to make sure that you keep an accurate record of your time in laboratory. You make sure that you write down the pertinent information. And so you have cyclohexanol, phosphoric acid, and cyclohexene, which are your, um, the, the three chemical materials you're going to be working with during lab this week.
And as usual, you want to make sure that you have that pertinent information, the molecular weight of each of those species. In the case of acids or other solutions, the concentration of those solutions rather than molecular weight is typically more appropriate. Um, they're generally used in excess in um, uh, reaction uh, systems. So um, your, in this case, your cyclohexanol should be one-to-one -one with your cyclohexane. In order to achieve a high yield, what you want to do is make sure that um, you have first assembled your fractional distillation apparatus. That's the first thing you want to do when you get into lab. Um, once you have that apparatus checked by an instructor, then you want to charge your 50 mil. Now, if you don't have a 50 mil round bottom flask, you can use a larger one. It's always better to use a slightly larger flask than a smaller one. And then you want to add the appropriate amount of cyclohexanol and phosphoric acid to your flask hook it up to your fractional distillation uh, apparatus and then uh, allow that to react. Once the receiving flask um, uh, contains your product, so basically once you start to see that that drips over uh, at a reasonable rate, you're going to collect that, dry your product, filter it in the hood. So don't filter this on the bench top, filter this in the hood and then you can characterize this uh, with an infrared spectrum. If you take a small test tube of your cyclohexene and dilute it with dilute it by a small amount with chloroform. You can take a solution phase spectrum of your compound um, and manage the odor some. We have one modification, one major modification to this lab, and that is we're going to be um, removing the simple distillation step. There's a second distillation in the protocol that is not required for this lab. Um, now. We found that the magnesium sulfate, and there's a, a I think it's a sodium sulfate was prescribed. We use magnesium sulfate in our lab. It works uh, fine at removing the water in the sample. However, this might require multiple washes depending on your particular sample. So you just need to uh, get clarification if you, um, if you have any issue there. The other major modification to this lab is you want to scale this up by twofold, right? So you want to double the amount of cyclohexanol and you want to double the amount of phosphoric acid which will hopefully lead to double the amount of cyclohexene. The reason for that is that this is a two-step lab, right? So we're going to take the cyclohexene next week um, after a break and we're going to oxidize it to adipic acid. And so in order for that reaction to happen efficiently, we need a little bit more of our starting material. So you scale up this reaction by twofold. So that is multiply everything um, in your reagents, your phosphoric acid, and your cyclohexanol by two. All right, now, this is a, a sample, uh, a, the example from your um, lab manual, uh, which is the apparatus for the dehydration of cyclohexanol. I just kind of want to run through um, the, uh, the key issues here. First of all, um, as I alluded to earlier, when your product begins to distill off into the collection flask, um, you'll observe sort of a steady drip. This is about one drop every one to five seconds or so. That should be your product. You want to make sure that you record the temperature as that's distilling. Now, the other thing you want to do is you want to kind of look at that distillation flask and make sure that it never runs dry. Okay, that's a very important part. You're probably going to want to build a foil tent around the distillation flask and the distilling column. Um, and the reason for that is because, uh, again, heat is lost very quickly as, it, um, as this vertical um, movement occurs. So the heat will sink and it will not be recirculated back to the top unless you have something trapping that heat in. So just, again, make that large foil tent. The only challenge there is that now your foil tent is blocking your distillation flask sight lines. So you'll need to remove that ever so often just to make sure that it does not... Um, uh, does not run dry. Okay, so let's go through a few pieces uh, in the distillation, the fractional distillation setup. Uh, the first thing is the distilling flask or the distillation flask. That's the flask that holds your reaction. Okay, now the other major uh, point uh, is the collection flask or also known as the receiving flask. So we have the distilling flask and now the receiving or collection flask. The receiving flask is where your product will ultimately end up. So that's the thing you want. So you want to make sure that's clamped and um, is is very stabilized in your um, um, in your setup in your apparatus. 
The other uh, major piece to the fractional distillation setup is the fractionating column um, <clears throat> or condenser. You're, you're going to have um, uh, a, a, your larger condenser, your fatter condenser can be packed with uh, this, in this case it says steel, we use a uh, modified plastic material called burl saddles and those burl saddles can be packed into that interior portion of the column that increases the surface area so that you get more evaporation and condensation events which ultimately leads to a purer product. Your condensing um, uh, column is uh, going to be a water-cooled condenser. Again, you'll notice that water goes in at the bottom, out at the top, and that's where the vapors condense. And then you'll notice it's at, an, at, it's at a slight angle, um, and so that then the, uh, um, the liquid will drop down just via gravity into your collection flask. Um, we do not have electronic uh, thermocouples. You will just use a standard thermometer. But notice um, where the thermo thermocouple in this, in this case is in, ter in, in terms of the uh, relative region of the tip of that thermocouple related to the distillation uh, adapter. You want to make sure that your thermometer hits just in that neck, um, in that, that Y neck of the distillation adapter. That's for uh, an accurate temperature reading. The other thing that we're going to have is a drying tube. Um, this helps to uh, remove any of the water vapor um, and, and keep that from condensing into the collection flask. Ultimately, what you're going to be distilling over is cyclohexane and water. It's, it's a steam distillation. And so um, a steam distillation just means you're co-distilling your product with water. And so you're going to have water and cyclohexane. Well, we don't want the water. We just want the cyclohexane. In fact, the water makes the characterization very, very tough. So we have to get rid of the water. Um, the, the purpose of the workup is um, to remove the water, in fact. So we're going to take the receiving flask and add magnesium sulfate to it to remove all the water. So uh, the addition of the drying tube here is to try to minimize that issue as much as possible. Now, as you think about what you're doing in this experiment, um, you want to make sure that you kind of have an idea of what's happening in terms of the starting material and product. So you should notice that, again, this reaction, um, as, as shown in your lab manual, is not balanced, that we do have an equivalent of water. This is called a dehydration reaction. Um, the difference between a dehydration and a condensation reaction is typically a condensation reaction involves a much uh, more elaborate rearrangement um, or coupling of two larger molecules with the subsequent elimination of water as a byproduct. In this example, in the dehydration reaction, um, the major elementary step is the loss of water um, to give you a completely separate molecule. So that's the only thing that's happening is the loss of water, um, which is contrasted to the aldol condensation, wherein there are many more um, uh, conversions taking place the loss of water simply being one of those um, elementary steps. As in the uh, past uh, post-lab grading, you want to make sure that you use your rubric as your title page. Um, you want to make sure that both partners sign the front page in order to receive full credit. And you want to make sure that you have a, a generalized and adequate and well-written experimental procedure. And your results must be tabulated and neat and uh, legible and include all characterization data and, and, core, and, and as well as including the total mass yield and percent yield and of course your appendix must include both copies of the lab notebook entries. I'd like to thank the folks at um, the University of Oregon, Dr. Brandt and the other instructors, Dr. Weatherman, Dr. Allison, as well as the Aldrich Chemical Company and the Journal of Organic Chemistry for um, their assistance and supplemental information in this pre-lab video. I'd also like to thank you for, in for your attention and hope you have a fun and safe and excellent organic lab this week.